uh, welcome everybody to this um, uh, to this live about uh, molting and molting rations. Today with us we have Jeff Maddox and Alicia Walsh. They are both uh, nutritionists at Fertrell. Uh, they have lots of experience. They have helped us tremendously. Uh, anytime I have a question, I can just shoot it over and I get an answer. It's just incredible. So uh, Jeff also wrote a book that I have here and I recommend everybody uh, gets if you don't have it yet. It's called Pasture Poultry Feeding and Management. And though it's written from the pasture poultry point of view, it's good for anybody who owns chicken. There is so much information in there. It's just incredible. It's uh, it's, I have it on my desk all the time because when I get questions, I just go to the index page, find the answer, and it's right there. So I would recommend that you get it. And um, there are lots of um, resources too on our, um, on our website. If you go to tigacres.com, you'll see that there is a resource page. I try to put there all the uh, podcasts that I find with Jeff. He's uh, recorded several with uh, Kenny Troiano at um, uh, Breeders Academy. That is something else that I recommend you follow because they have a lot of information there. And Alisa has her master's degree in um, animal, animal nutrition, and she's been super helpful with our customers as well. So we're really glad to have them here today. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, start with the first question, which will be very basic. And that is, what is molting? Because that's what we're going to be talking about. There might be people among you who've never, who haven't owned chicken long enough to um, to actually see them molt. So it's good to start with basics. Yeah. So molting is a natural behavior that happens to older birds where their worn old feathers basically, I think it shed is the way I want to say that, and they get replaced with new, fresher feathers. Um, it happens at least once a year, sometimes twice a year um usually whenever the days start to get shorter so that's about to start mm, yeah <laughs> i think for some people it already has started yeah i think mine are putting that one on me right now i'm pretty sure they are yeah so so then um are there any other external factors that will induce molting so you mentioned you know the days getting shorter is mm -hmm. there you know anything else yeah um you can also force a molt um and jeff please please add to this as you <clears throat> as you see fit but um so if you lose or if chickens aren't don't have water for an extended period of time that can force a molt um no feed can also force a molt and i think lighting can also force molt any kind of like major stress to the birds um yeah, that's that's it. You know, when the days when they're getting tired of laying eggs, and the days start getting shorter, then you com combine that with the heat stress of summer. They're just looking for an excuse to start the molt. I mean, they're just any type of stress. It can be uh, predator stress. It can be, you know, they ran out of water. They ran out of feed for an extended period of time. It could be. It could be anything. Right? They're they're literally just they're on that edge of ready to you know to do it i mean that's naturally occurring everybody's telling me here about middle of july they started seeing the first feathers drop and um we're right in the middle of the molt right now yeah when we were on the farm our chickens molted during the summer when we mm -hmm. wanted when we wanted eggs <laughs> Yeah, because customers came, uh, you know, they, they came, picked strawberries and they wanted eggs and that's when we didn't have mm -hmm. them. And they usually, yeah. they didn't resume production until uh, when the younger pullets came into lay. So there was mm -hmm. a, a time there where we could have auctioned our eggs, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> and Greg, what were you seeing whenever your birds started molting? Well, first of all, the... Uh, the first sign would be like a steady uh, production decrease, mm -hmm. a production decrease, and then f feather loss. That was the two main signs. And it was like a yearly thing, like, like a clock. It was very regular, you know, every time. 
it was at that time of the year that that they did it as the day started to get shorter well no because uh you know we're talking uh, june july so that's when uh, that's what it was quite atypical when it comes to you know everything that we that we see here you know days getting shorter changing temperatures and all that it was kind of independent of all those things they just did it then and that was it yeah so do yeah go ahead um i was just going to say for for those that are listening that are have egg laying flocks for where they're selling eggs and they don't want to have the molt happen at that time of year mm -hmm. so when they start their flock is important as far as you know you just talked about the pullets so starting a flock sometime in mid to late april you know that's going to start laying around that time uh, we'll get through that first molt in june july and august um, and they can also use lights on timers to keep the bird stimulated so they don't let the day get shorter and the bird will continue to lay and then but they need to pick a time to let let those birds molt um they have to go through the molt to be a good second cycle bird you know or second lay cycle you know birds really only designed to lay for about 30 weeks out of the year 30 to 40 weeks out of the year and then she needs a break so she's either going to take it or you're going to give it to her. It's one way or the other. Right. Um, but they do need that break. And so, yeah, I mean, there's things you can do to prevent it, but eventually it's going to happen and it needs to happen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so, it's hard work for them to lay eggs consistently. Um, so giving them that break is going to, it also helps with shell quality and, and egg quality also. Oh, yeah. Yes. So do all chicken molt naturally? Is it something yeah. that they will do all systematically? It, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a bodily uh, requirement, something that is necessary for them to go through. Yep, all birds, uh, not just chickens, all birds are gonna go through some style of molt and it can either be controlled or uncontrolled. Uncontrolled molt can take up to three months to finish, 90 mm -hmm. days. Whereas if you take a little bit of control, excuse me. Oh, bless you. Yes, I, I, see, I see a question here that I'm gonna put up so we can cover it uh, because it's one of the questions that I have a, I had as well. What about flocks with varying ages, some younger ones who wouldn't naturally be molting this year? I'm guessing it's better not to force a molt by introducing stresses like food and water. Yeah, younger birds that are still developing or they haven't, you know, they're not a year old or so. Um, there's no need to molt those or push, put them through that forced molt. <clears throat> um, but if you're running a group flock with multiple different ages, it's going to be really hard, you know, unless you can separate and feed those older birds separately, you know, some type of a molt ration to help them through uh, with a controlled amount. It's... Uh, that's one of the drawbacks to having a multiple age flock is you lose the ability to control things like the molt. So you just get what you get and you're happy with it. Um, but they're going to be much less efficient on their second cycles. Okay, so let's go back here. So can we basic maybe cover uh, why is it desirable to induce a molt? What are the health benefits of a yearly molt? Inducing a molt just gives you a little bit more control. So you're kind of making having all of the birds molt at the same time as opposed to it being more sporadic. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess you can be more specific with their needs, whether that's in terms of feeding and water and things along those lines. Um, and the health benefits we talked about earlier is just giving their body a break and letting them reset. Um, it helps with shell quality and egg quality. Yes, I heard Jeff say that during that molt, you can actually help them shed some of the um, uh, extra fat that they might mm -hmm. be actually building up, yep. uh, internal yeah. fat. Yeah, so a molt 
Oh, gone, Jeff. Go ahead. That's fine. Um, a mold diet is going to be lower in energy, usually higher in fiber and lower in protein. So the aim of basically the aim of the mold is to help them reduce their body size to roughly what they were for commercial layers um, to the size they were at 18 weeks. So they're not going to be quite pullet size. They're going to be a little bit bigger, but you want that to help them just kind of drop some weight, shed some internal body fat. Um, that's one of the main goals of it. So if you like reproductive health, you need a little bit of body fat, but too much can also cause issues. It can affect your lay rate. Um, there's only so much in their space in their body to lay an egg. So if they, they're coated in internal fat, uh, you're going to have some issues. Okay. And so um, this was another question we had uh, early in the life of a chicken. Can a mold be induced? So we're looking at, you know, the first year they wouldn't get it. And then right. once they've gone through a full laying cycle is when you would want to do that. Yeah, I mean, even when they're younger and developing, they're going to they're going to do a real slight molt. It's not going to be as noticeable. You're just going to see some feathers recycle. Um, it doesn't have the same depth and impact on the bird as after that first lay cycle or after they're, you know, more than a year old. Um, the younger birds are going to, yeah, they're still going to go through just a little slight molt. You're not, you're hardly going to notice it. You'll see it, but it's not. You know, it's not significant to their life. Okay. And um, now this is another question. I know that some people here have um, multiple kinds of birds that they are raising together. So, uh, for example, let's say you run your laying hands with some ducks. Are they all going to be able to eat the same ration that you'll be feeding your, um, uh, your laying hands as they are molting? Yes, during the molt, they'll be able to eat the same molt ration. Um, hopefully, you're getting a real molt ration put together or made up for you because mm -hmm. uh, it is significantly different than a regular chicken ration. Um, <clears throat> you know, like Alyssa said, it's going to be a lot lower in energy. It's going to be a lot higher in fiber, you know, and it, it's just it's designed as a weight loss program, you know, or a crash diet in order to get somewhere between 15 and 20% of the body weight off of the hen during that period of time. We want her to reabsorb and burn off internal stored fat. Um, I just had a lady reach out to me and one of her pet hens just died. And when she opened it up, there was just gobs, like, like a pint jar worth of hard yellow fat all throughout the internal organs. So letting birds eat, whether on the molt or off the molt, letting birds eat all that they want anytime that they want them and then giving them some scratch grain on top of that just because it makes you feel good is mm -hmm. really harmful to our chickens. So, killing them with kindness. Killing them with kindness. Yeah, I wish you right, so if I, if I uh, pick your brain on that a little farther, if we have, see for example, my chickens, they're fed a ration that you formulated and they are fed a certain amount per day. So they are not, uh, it's not that they can free choice all the time. They have some uh, food in the morning, some at night, and they eat that. And that, uh, that um, supplies them with what, uh, with what they need. Can we expect the same kind of uh, fat deposits to build up? Not the gobs no, and gobs of fat like this lady was no. seeing. <clears throat> Okay, even on a controlled diet of say four ounces a day, which is the way we design our chicken feeds, mm -hmm. there's still mm -hmm. eventually going to be some fat deposits inside that chicken, mm -hmm. but not, yeah, not anywhere like what I just described. And, mm -hmm. you know, and that makes the molt actually easier mm -hmm. when we go through the molt because we don't have as much body weight to lose. But even, even in a commercial type chicken, we're going to lose. 15 to 20 percent because there's fat layered under the skin there's internal fats um, we need to get the ovaries shrunk back down to, so that the egg size is good the eggs are or the ovaries are efficient we get you know better egg laying in the next cycle so okay yeah, we're, we're still losing weight but it's a combination of fat and um, fat and muscle all right 
All right. So I have another comment here from uh, Tamara Smith. She says, uh, Jeff, this slight molt of young birds that you refer to, is that what we're seeing in broilers at about seven weeks? Yeah, um, especially the the birds at uh, in July and August when we're getting our highest temperatures. Mm -hmm. You know, you're <clears throat> kind of, but seven weeks is a little bit early, but it's, they're still getting triggered by their uh, photo uh, photo receptors and their instinct at this time of the year to want to molt. Um, hopefully you're not seeing that on early batches and batches later in the year, but this July, August batches, um, I believe the time of year, length of day and all that is triggering these birds to shed off some feathers. Okay, and then another question. How long does the molt last? Whether induced or naturally? Oh wait, that's two different things. <laughs> okay, so there you go. A good a good induced molt should only take about forty five days before you put them back on layer feed okay. and start and start increasing their lights to make them stimulate them to lay. Um, a ad lib, you know, however the hen wants to do it, it can be sixty days, it can be ninety days, it can be six months, you know just whatever you know, whatever makes her happy and the older that she gets the longer the molt is going to take it seems like that's been my observation uh, have you seen that uh, doing that yearly molt will actually increase the lifespan of the bird yeah mm -hmm. yeah the yeah. lifespan yeah yeah because if i get rid of that internal fat <clears throat> and i shrink her back down um she's going to be healthier on that right. next okay. cycle that makes sense. um you know right now i'm working with people with eight-year-old hens that are still laying eggs so uh that's How? not off eight eight, eight eight years old eight yeah. wow yeah so no, but, you know it can be is, done that is a very important point because you know on the if you have eight-year-old hens that can still lay, that means that, you know, your uh, laying hens, replacement pullets, and all mm -hmm. that uh, expense and can be can be shrunk. Well, now look, at eight years old, you're not getting a 90% rate of lay. Okay? No. So <laughs> no, <I'm not. clears throat> you're going to be doing about 40 and 50, maybe uh, occasional 60% rate of lay. So yeah. you have to look at your economics, but mm -hmm. for a person who's breeding, yeah. if they have that special hen to be able to keep her longer and get viable mm -hmm. chicks out of her, that's right. really, really important. And yeah, yeah. So boosting that's where her health during the molt is important. Yeah, like the, what your goals are, I think, is what matters there. Right. Like if you're, yeah. you're looking for high lay rate and production, not necessarily like hatchability and, and breeders, it's going to be a little bit different. Yes, but from a breeding standpoint, it would it would yeah. definitely it would definitely matter. Yep. It, and so now, dear is what ration to feed chickens during a molt? What are the most important nutrients to supply um, during that time? So uh, I think what I'm going to do is share my screen. Uh, share a screen. Can you see this? No. Jeff, I don't yeah. know if I've ever seen a molt ration in a store. You don't. You don't. I mean, they're going to either have to hand mix it or they're going to have to. Uh, <clears throat> have it custom. Yeah, they're going to either have to hand mix it or get a custom. Yeah. Um, Ingrid, can you zoom in? Take... Zoom yeah. in, sure. How Sorry, Jeff, that? what were you saying? Let's see. How is that? Good. Uh, scroll okay. down a little bit, Ingrid, just so we can see the oats are right at the very top. That way we can see some of the ingredients yeah. or the, some of the nutrients. There we go. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Right. <clears throat> uh, so if everybody looks at this, you know, the number one ingredient is actually oats. And then number two is alfalfa. So if you look down below, I'm pushing a really high crude fiber up around 10%. And part of why I'm doing that 
is for the biggest reason I'm doing that is so the bird feels full and satiated longer, quicker and longer. Okay. Because when you're on a molt ration, you're only feeding uh, 60% of what you would be feeding weight wise of a regular feed. So a good molt ration is going to be for, let's say for a sex length or a four and a half pound bird, you know, two and a half ounces is what we want to feed the bird. And that's not a lot of feed. So <clears throat> the poultry Nutribalancer has been doubled in here. It's got a significant amount of calcium in it. So we're rebuilding bones. We're rebuilding, you know, we're strengthening health, but um, really low protein, 12.8%, uh, fat levels down considerably. Normally I like a five to 6% fat or higher, um, but the fiber is really, really high. And Alyssa referred to the, the uh, poultry energy and that's down line 31 where it says uh, ME poultry, which is metabolized energy for poultry. Um, this is down at 1,026. So we're kind of targeting that 1,000 to 1,100 range. Um, <clears throat> and then plus the reduced amount of feed, her total caloric intake every day is really low. So it's going to it's going to push the fat right off of her, get her to tone up, firm up, um, and get ready for the next lay cycle. Normal energy um, it for a hen is around 1280 to 1300. So this is roughly 30% less than a normal diet in energy, um, calorie wise. Okay. So I have to, if you're done commenting on that, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. So I Unless somebody has a question about it, but yeah, that's. Yeah. If there are questions, you're going to have to pick them up because I can't see them. I can't either. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Let's Let's there we go. Okay, I don't see any comments or questions. All right, so the most important nutrients to supply during the molt, I mean, there is a lot that's supplied there with double the amount of uh, PNB. PNB is already very, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's already top of the line there. So if you, you're really giving them uh, all their uh, vitamins and minerals and all that requirement are still well supplied actually more than usual uh, for the hen the top yeah. two nutrients are going to be calcium then phosphorus and then zinc uh, so those are going to be the top minerals that we're replacing back into the bone structure of the hen getting it built back um, so she has a good eggshell quality for the next lay cycle um, those are the heaviest used minerals during that, during her laying period. So we have to replenish what was stored in the bone. Okay. Now, sometimes you'll have hands who have, uh, eggshell issues, uh, you know, either it's, uh, uneven or you have deposits on it or, um, you know, the shells is a little weak. Can you expect to see, uh, improvement on that after a molt if it's done properly? Yeah, eggshell quality should improve. Now, it's not going to last as long. The quality of the eggshell is not going to last as long as it did in the first cycle, in the first lay cycle. But mm -hmm. yes, uh, initially after the molt, those those eggs should come back to being like a pullet egg, very firm, well calcified. And But instead of being the last few months of the lay cycle, about halfway through the next lay cycle, you're mm -hmm. going to see that calcium is going to start deteriorating or it's going to be less. She's just depositing less. Okay. Okay. And then here, why does the egg production go down during molting? Will it resume on its own after the molt? Uh, I mean, it's uh, during the molt, they shouldn't be laying eggs. It's supposed to kind of turn itself off. Um, okay. <clears throat> resuming is going to depend on the, the, the type of bird, the age of bird. Um, there's a lot of variables there. Um, you know, without adding supplemental light, it, it, it will not resume on its, it may not resume on its own after the molt. Okay. Depending mm -hmm. on the breed and the age of the bird. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be an automatic thing where they just start laying eggs again after the molt. So, 
Okay, so this is uh, part of the reason that they stop laying because a lot of the nutrients that they're eating, a lot of the nutrients coming from the feed is going to restoring their feathers, regrowing their feathers, as opposed to egg production. Okay. And then here, do you have tips on how to manage the nutritional needs of the whole flock during molting if there are birds that are just coming into lay? Yeah, a mixed flock. Like I mentioned that earlier, but a mixed flock with different ages and different um, stages of laying, mm -hmm. it's it really is nearly impossible to try and do an effective molt without separating the birds. Okay. All right. And uh, now this is a tricky one. How can a commercial ration be modified during molting? If people are buying, you know, a commercial ration, is there something that they can do to achieve the same results as what you are, uh, you know, doing with uh, with a molting ration? Because those, I mean, there obviously there are people who buy those commercial feeds because they don't have the room to mix their own or they don't have access to ingredients. So how, what can be done? I mean, just, you could add oats to it. Yeah, right? I was going to say, just off the top of my head, um, you would be, so first off, you take the commercial feed and you cut it 50% with oats. So you're doing one-to-one. -one. Okay. And then you have to get the Nutribalancer and some added calcium back in there to the you know, to the desired level. Mm -hmm. um, so like oyster shells, could you yeah. put them out free choice or would it be better mixed in? I like it both. I like some mixed in the feed just so I know they saw it, you know, when they're coming to eat. Mm -hmm. And I think it encourages a higher level of uptake of the oyster shell when it's mm -hmm. in the feed, but yeah. you can still have some free choice. So. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So now, are there differences between breeds uh, on how they, you know, they go through uh, through a molt, how long it is, how, or is it fairly fairly similar? Say, so, yeah, I have out there, I have barred rocks and orp uh, mm -hmm. lavender orpingtons. Are they gonna? Is it gonna be the same or? It should be the same. Yeah, it's um, the same principle. If, it, if you're under control, it'll be the same. Okay. All right, and I think I think we went through all the questions that we had uh, prepared. Oh no, there is one here that uh, was asked: Does one need to be careful in handling the chickens when the new feathers are coming through? Can they break breed lead more easily? Yeah, most people don't handle their birds during the molt any more than they absolutely have to. So mm -hmm. they are pretty delicate at that time. You know, those uh, feather follicles, you know, they're going through a really big transition. If you, you know, like don't move the pen that they're in, don't, don't mm -hmm. jostle them, don't, you know, don't handle them any more than absolutely necessary. Okay, that's not a good time to be picking up and petting your best chicken or your most friendly chicken. And so, um, yeah, yeah, just they're going to be I mean, very sore. Yeah, be sensitive to their needs at the time and don't, uh, yeah, just don't be fussing with them any more than you have to. Just try and keep them comfortable, calm and comfortable as best you can. Yeah. Uh, right. You also want to keep the lights at a low level. So, like even for our the outdoor birds somehow we got to make sure they're shaded as heavily as possible um mm -hmm. you know they're missing a bunch of feathers so they're going to be subject to sunburn just like you or i but also that light intensity can cause them to start pecking each other because we've just reduced their overall nutrition significantly they're going to be really grumpy so right you know, think about throwing a half a watermelon in there or something for them to peck at, or mm -hmm. they can have all the alfalfa hay that they want, right? So if you want a free choice alfalfa hay to them, mm -hmm. do it, you know, put in slices as often as they go through them. It gives them something to peck at besides each other. So they're going to be really, really miserable during this period. Yeah, that was something I was thinking of actually last night. I wondered, does it, made, uh, does it make them grumpy? And I guess it does. 
So here is a question from Rebecca. If you force the mold, do you let them naturally come back out of it and then introduce layer feed again? Or can you control the length of time? Sorry, I was distracted if this was talked about. <clears throat> um, so once you hit the target weight, so you weigh your birds before you start the mold, right? So before they come into it, you know, when they're the prettiest or the biggest or whatever, get an average weight on them. Um, and then once you've achieved that 15 to 20% body weight loss, then you can go right back over to layer feed and let them start rebuilding feathers and coming back in. So it's usually about 30, 30 to 40 days, 30 to, somewhere in there that they're going to be featherless and on the molt ration before you can come back over to the layer ration or a higher protein ration. So whether you go over back to a grower, like an 18 or 19% grower, or whether you go back to your layer, um, completely up to you. If you're expecting to come back into lay, you might as well go right back on the layer and start increasing the lights um, at six weeks into the molt, 45 days or so. Start, you know, gradually increasing the lights to stimulate them to come back into production. Okay. And now I just had a question that I forgot for some reason. I was picking up on something you just said and it's gone. Boy, it's good to have a memory, but when it works, it's better. Uh, <laughs> what was it that you said? If somebody else has a question, please type it in so that we can share it while I try to collect <laughs> my thoughts. <laughs> Oh, that was it. Thank you, Rebecca. Our booster's fine going through this too. That was exactly what I was. <clears throat> yeah, the molt's not just for hens. The molt is for all fowl, males, females, you know, the whole bit. So yeah, they need to go through the molt as well. Um, and they should be going through it just like the hens are because we want to, again, get rid of any internal fat. We want to reduce body weight. We want to tighten them up, <laughs> get them firmer more fit, you know, kind of get them back to those teenage years look, kind of if that helps, you know. Um, but that's also going to shrink down the testes and help with uh, sperm. So for breeding flocks, you know, we're going to end up with a better breeding season if the hens go right, right through. Yep. Okay, that's good. So then um, we touched a little bit on that. What about turkeys? Would turkeys go through the same same thing? Yep. Ducks, quails, are we? Yep. Yeah. All, all birds are going to go through a molt, to my knowledge. I'm okay. sure there's an exception to that rule, but um, yeah, all birds are going to go through a molt. Whether we help them through the molt or whether they do it on their own, mm -hmm. they're going to they're going to have a time of year when they shed off feathers and rebuild. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have another question? If you do, please type it in. Yeah. Do you know who asked? And I don't need to know, but I mean, do you know the person who asked about using a commercial feed or their regular feed and making oh. a mold out of that? No, that was uh, that is something that I thought about because we have some people who uh, use a commercial ration and then they add P and B to it. So I know that there are people out there who would, uh, you know, who would need that that information. <clears throat> okay. I mean, so if you know those people, are they if they're listening and they reach out to you, you know, after the fact. Yeah. Um, if they get a really good picture of the tag of what they're feeding. Yes. And, and get it to us um, mm -hmm. with whatever nutritional information. <clears throat> you know, Alyssa and I can plug that in, figure out how to turn that into a molt ration, give them a little bit more precise numbers than what I gave earlier or generically. So, right. That yeah. sounds good. Okay. I have a question here. Not molt related, but how do you best store eggs? Washed and refrigerated, unwashed, refrigerated, unwashed counter? I guess you have to stock up on eggs before you start that. So that's a relevant question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I, you know, I'm always encouraging people to have two flocks, one incoming, one outgoing. So whether you're going through the molt or, or, you know, whatever your cycle is, but you've always started a new batch of birds, you know, in the spring to start laying in the spring because your old birds are getting tired and worn out. <clears throat> so they're going to de be declining anyway. So it takes a lot of the hills and valleys out of your egg demand by always starting a flock in the spring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know in Canada, when is your highest demand for eggs? Is it over the holidays when people are doing a lot of baking or? Uh, well, there's got to be a season to it. It's just, what is it? And, well, people obviously do a lot of baking and say, uh, you know, November, December, January, all that, when they, there is, there are all the holidays and all that, mm -hmm. I would think. And then that's the eggnog season too, though I'm not sure who makes that on their own. Um, so we usually, we had a lot of eggs at that time and we could supply it, but it seems that I'm not sure. I think it might be very, it might vary on your custom base too. Well, you said people wanted eggs when they came for strawberries in June yeah. and, you know, but each region of the country is a little bit different as far as when the demand for eggs is there. Um, see, for us, when the kids get out of school, when the children are no longer in school, they have their summer break. Mm -hmm. People are doing vacations, they're doing other things, the, you know, and their demand for eggs is not that high. Yeah. Um, we also see a slump in January for some reason, right after the holidays. It's like everybody goes on a diet for January and February. So yep. March and April are really good. March, April and May are good. Yeah. Um, then June, July and August are slow. And then it starts to pick up again when the children go back to school for, you know, in the fall. That's kind of what we see down here. Yeah, see, the people wanted eggs because they got strawberries is because they knew that, I mean, they wanted our eggs and they were already there for strawberries. So because it was strawberry season, it wasn't so much that our uh, egg demand increased then, but the traffic at the farm increased because people came to pick their strawberries. So they were expecting to be able to have uh eggs at the same time but that's when we had less than usual so it wasn't so much a increased demand for eggs as increased traffic because mm -hmm. it was strawberry season fresh vegetables and all and all that it's, i think if i can if i can pin it that's yeah. uh, that would have been it <clears throat> yeah. um, marnie said that their egg sales have gone a lot gone down a lot through july and august okay Okay, so I had a question from Tamara. Does age matter in their ability to mold? I've had old birds. Uh, I couldn't get to mold and they had ratty feathers for the last five years of their lives. <laughs> yeah, if we don't start this, uh, Tamara, if we don't start this earlier, you know, in their life and get it under control in the first couple of years, um, yeah, I, I'm hearing that a lot, that there's a bunch of five and six year old birds that just will not go into a molt on their own. Um, and it's a whole lot harder for them at that point. And they just kind of get stuck in that limbo, like you're talking about with ratty feathers. And, um, so I, I'm hearing that from other breeders, people that are keeping birds for a long time. And, uh, yeah, that, that is a true statement that you know, if we haven't, if we don't start this with the young and continue it on an <clears throat> annual basis, that you're going to have older hens that just are not going to give up, not going to go through the molt. And yeah, that's just how it's going to go. Okay. And Dana says that she makes eggnog good. We're going to have to meet actually and make, <laughs> have a cup together. <laughs> now I have a uh, Sheena Carlson is a molt as described healthy for breeds that typically don't go through distinct molt cycles like other birds. For example, tiny ceramas are known to continuously molt year round, dropping a few plumes each day. Uh, Sheena, they're still gonna they're still gonna be uh, uh, about a month out of the year. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> when that recycling isn't occurring. Um, and it depends on where you are and it's a little bit breed sp specific. I, I can't say about the ceramics, but they, they should, yes, still have um, a significant molt season or period of the year. Um, letting them, you know, doing the, I mean, all birds lose a few feathers along the way here and there, mm -hmm. and then they grow them back throughout the year. Um, that's very normal. Uh, but they all have, you know, a distinct molting period. And I think helping them through that molt um, is going to be beneficial to you, especially if you're showing them or, you know, if they need to be, you know, look above average. I think you want to help them out with the molt. Um, that's just my opinion on it. But they're, I think they're going to need to have a, a, a molting period. Okay. I have, if you have uh, second questions uh, after Jeff and Elisa answers, please, please let us know. This is from Jean. Okay, so I show birds and when we wash them or go to a show, sometimes they drop feathers. So on a second mold, can we push them back faster than 30 to 40 days on the second mold? <sighs> That's pushing it. Uh, <clears throat> I... Yeah, I, not that I know of. I, I I don't want to say we can't do it. I'd have to really scratch my head and come up with a special diet to make that happen. I think we could, you know, if uh, Gene had everything that we wanted to make, you know, the appropriate feeds with, I think we could, but I'm not going to promise that. I mean, that's that's a really tight schedule to try and get it done under 40 days. And for people who show birds like Gene, <clears throat> it's, um, you know, the show season just is too close to the natural molting season. It's really hard to, to you know, a, a lot of people struggle with that, right? They're trying to do shows in August and September, and the molt really hasn't finished correctly or really hasn't completed its cycle. And it's hard to have birds ready to go at that time of the year. So we either have to figure out by lighting and nutrition how to delay the molt till later in the year, or we need to trigger it <clears throat> through nutrition and lighting to be earlier. You know, so around June 15th, drop those, you know, put them on a crash diet, take away the lights and force them to molt. But then you're cutting into your egg laying cycle. You know, how many eggs you're gonna have for hatching. Okay, I'll take Rebecca's question here. If you force the mold, when ideally should it start in Canada? Mid-September-ish. Like, like I, yeah, I was explaining to, I don't know what kind of weather you have where you are, Rebecca, right now, but we had uh, here in Sundry, we had the first frost at Visory uh, last night, actually. So temperatures are going down. Our first frost date here is... Uh, August 26th. So there are different climates, definitely. You know, somebody in, uh, say, British Columbia in the Vancouver area where they have very temperate, temperate but humid weather are going to have to handle that differently than, you know, us where, you know, quite frankly, in a month we could have snow here and not just a little bit of it. <laughs> <clears throat> So in a way, in a way, that mold that we had at the farm during the summer months was possibly the best thing that could happen because at least it's warm. Now there is the sun that, you know, you don't want them to sunburn either, but it's, it's kind of this, the, uh, the schedule can be a little tricky that way. Yeah, and I don't know what Rebecca is doing with her hands and just popped into my head is, you know, um, Jean said, that they were showing birds. Um, Rebecca's birds, are they for eggs and egg sales or is she showing birds? Um, but ideally this July, August molt is as good as it. I mean, that's a good time to do it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That's when the bird wants to do it naturally. Mm -hmm. I just think we should be in better control to guide them through it. You know, mm -hmm. 
with the proper nutrition and the proper environment. Um, yeah. But, it, you know, when folks are posting questions, it might be helpful to know if they're doing egg sales. Are they mm -hmm. breeders? Are they show? You know, um, it yeah. will change the answer slightly. Yes, Jean has uh, uh, is breeding birds and she has show birds. So she uh, a lot of people purchase chicks from her. I don't know if she does uh, uh, hatching eggs. I'm not aware of that, but I got some. I got some chicks from her. She lives uh, close to close to where we are. I'm not sure what Rebecca does. Maybe she can drop us a line to tell us. Yeah, Jean, in Jean's case, it's going to be different. So we're going to try and trigger that molt ahead of the show schedule, mm -hmm. um, or at least some of those birds. And a lot of times the show folks keep their birds separated more so you know where they'll have pairs and trios in a pen so we can do select pens we don't have to do the entire flock you know right uh, they're they're probably not you know running in you know a large group so to speak so okay so here is rebecca there you go uh what if you free range and pasture your chickens because a crash diet do enough to cause the malt or do they need light restrictions too no we can do it with feed we can do it with feed and water if we have to i hate to do it with water um, you start with feed <clears throat> you actually do um, a feed restriction where we take away feed for 24 to 48 hours um, and it all depends on when we see the last egg so, mm -hmm. you know, we take away feed to, to for 24 hours, see how many birds quit laying. We may have to do it a second time for 24 hours um, and then putting them on that high fiber, low protein, low energy diet. We should be able to trigger the molt. There's always going to be one or two stubborn hens that are going to prove you wrong and lay right through the molt. That's just OK. So uh, they're not all going to agree at the same time. But yes, I believe uh, even on free range and in pasture, we may not move them on the pasture. We may consolidate their area or restrict their area just to trigger the molt. But once we've got them in the molt, then we're good. Okay. Then once we get the egg laying shut off, yes, we can do it with a, with a restricted diet. Okay. And I don't know if Rebecca heard your question because her phone uh, died. Uh, Rebecca, Jeff wanted to know if you're doing showbirds or if you're just, um, or breeding, if you're a breeder or if you just uh, have um, hens for, for egg production. <clears throat> and it's not that critical. It's just as people are asking their questions, you know, it was nice that Jean said she had showbirds and yeah. So, you know, my answer can change a little bit based on, you know, when's the show season? How do we manage those birds? Because if they weren't show birds, I would have just stayed, you know, do the molt in July and August. And, but trying to get them, trying to get them turned around in 30 to 40 days, um, we'd need a really special diet to make that happen. I mean, yeah, uh, that'd be like all in and on a crash diet and, uh, you know, Three weeks later, we're putting them on a high potency diet with high protein, high amino acids, and to get those feathers back in in time for to go to the show. Yes. Are there any other questions from? from it doesn't any? have to be about molting. You know, we're nope. here. We have time. We can ask whatever poultry That's questions great. I got. Yep. Yeah, if you have a chance, I would grab it. <laughs> I really like that church, Jeff. I really do. <laughs> so I'll see if I can find. I'll it. see if I can find the link of where I bought it, and uh, I'll share it. Sure, sure. And if anybody wants that, uh, am I free to share that uh, molting ration that we shared on the screen, Jeff? Well, it's going to be more of a U.S., you know, where you can get soybean meal and corn. Um, okay. If you have enough of an interest in Canada for people who want to do a molt. Yep. So 
but the key elements are gonna be the oats, the barley, the alfalfa meal. Um, okay. okay, a little bit of wheat's fine. The wheat can replace the corn in the diet. Uh -huh. That's not a problem. And then, but finding the protein sources, the right protein sources are gonna right. be difficult, so. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I guess, oh, Dana likes your shirt as well. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> No, it's I saw you wear it the other day. I can't remember. I think you were at a show with Kenny and you wore it. And I thought, yeah. wow, that's her shirt. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions from anyone about anything poultry or animal for that matter? We can be very general. Yeah. The uh, the website where I ordered this shirt is yep. and they're saying um, will be open soon. So mm -hmm. it, they, they're out in California. They're out in San Diego. Uh -huh. So they may actually, you know, with the uh, with the COVID coming back, they might be shut they might down, be yeah. temporarily shut down. Mm. Oh really? Are you you guys? <clears throat> Have you have like uh, things are shutting down again in your depends on what state you live in, but yeah. yes, yeah. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Well, so far here in Alberta, for now, we are somewhat open more than we've been for the for a long time. I don't know if we still have any restrictions left for now, anyways, right? Which is which is nice. Yeah, enjoy it while it lasts because I think it's coming back around again. So probably, probably as flu season comes, we'll see that come back. Yeah. Okay, curious about the alpha alpha. This is Marnie. Hey, cubes pellets. I don't know what might be available here in Grand Prairie. Here is in here is in short supply in Alberta. Um, if you are, I, I mean. If you're looking for pellets, we do have some Marnie, but then I'll let uh, uh, Jeff answer that. The alfalfa pellets, they're pretty hard for the chickens and they just don't eat them very well. So if you're going to do the alfalfa pellets, you need to make sure to grind them down. Um, otherwise, yeah. they're just going to leave them behind. Yeah, we also have customers <clears throat> who soak them. They, you soak, them. Oh, they okay. soak them overnight and then they feed that. And I guess the birds just just mm -hmm. go for it like yeah. like it's candy. I have a customer, I can't remember the exact recipe, but she mixes that with a tiny bit of molasses mm -hmm. and uh, she soaks that overnight and the, okay. the chickens just, just go for it. I think she might even be mixing the PNB in that. And then soaking it? Or no, or probably, probably soak with a little molasses and then the PNB mm -hmm. when she goes to uh, when she goes to feed it. It seems to be working working well for her. Nice. She was trying to she was trying to get some uh, uh, some greens into her chickens during the winter months. And mm -hmm. so she went with that and I guess it, it was good for the egg yolks and all that through yeah. the <clears throat> through winter. Yeah, alfalfa meal is great for helping with egg yolks, egg yolk color, I guess I should say. Yes. Yeah, no, it's good, and it's got uh, it's got good protein too. Uh, for for them, I mean, seventeen, nineteen percent—that's not bad. Mm -mm. Not like soy, not like soybeans, I guess. But <laughs> so the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, I put it in my. I put those in my garden. Tomatoes just love it. I put some of that very liberally in the corn. Just. Mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome. So mm -hmm. you would go with uh, with hay or alfalfa meal then. Yeah, but I mean, you, you can use any of you can use any of the hay cubes or pellets. But if you're going to go with the cubes or pellets, they need to be ground down. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why they just don't like pellets. Mm -mm. 
No. And I've had a couple of people tell me they tried feeding the pellets and they just leave them behind. Yes, mine do that too. I have some in the feed and if there are chunks that are not, you know, ground under a certain mm -hmm. size, they'll leave them. Now, if you put one of those in your mouth, you, I mean, I, I can relate why. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> a little too hard. <laughs> have you tried that, Ingrid? <laughs> Okay, then I was asking totally unrelated, but what makes a hen lay a double yolk? Just two yolks come down too close together and they, you know, they're not separated far enough apart. So two get released at the same time and they are in the oviduct just too close together. Mm. So. They get wrapped in the same package. Yep. And then the egg is usually larger too. I mean, the ones I've seen anyways, when when they're double yoker, some of them you can kind of guess. Mm -hmm. Some you can't, but mm. most of the time you you can. Does anybody, okay, there we go. We have, oh, she has a hen that consistently does that. So is mm -hmm. there a, uh, like a, um, um, like a weakness, a physiological defect that would cause that on a consistent basis? Um, okay, so in order to have a double yoker on a consistent basis, the egg has to be extra jumbo, extra big, just bigger than big, and um, which they're just, they're eating too much feed. So, mm -hmm more i see mostly that that occurring where people let the hens eat as much as they want to eat whenever they want to eat it and uh so i think that could be brought back under control although nobody ever does it because they love the double yokers for breakfast but um that can be brought back under control by restricting the amount of feed that the birds are eating you know mm -hmm. to that quarter pound you know four to five ounces a day mm -hmm. Um, that should, and that's plenty for the birds. If it's good quality feed, that's plenty for the birds. And they'll, mm -hmm. they'll kind of, the egg size will come back down to normal mm -hmm. and, uh, they'll live a long and prosperous life. Yeah. Big eggs are pretty hard on the chicken. Very hard on the chickens. Yeah. Maybe it's the uh, dominant chicken out there that can get all the food she wants. More than likely. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay, so now we have, I had a hand that only laid egg whites. Hmm. I could have made a mint of her, but only could clone her. I've so never seen that before. Happen? There's a new one for me, so. Oh yeah? Yeah. And she now is saying, I've tried pellets during the winter and her chickens wouldn't touch them. They don't like pellets. Mm -hmm. They really don't. It's too hard, um, I guess. Yeah. I. I you know, if you crumble them up or you turn them back into powder, they eat them. Um, they just, I don't know if it's an appearance thing, a smell. No. I don't know, but I can't no. get chickens to eat off alpha pellets without doing something to them, right? Mm -hmm. So whether you soak them, whatever, but it. Yeah, I'm going to try that this winter with, with mine. Right now, I feed them as much dandelions as, as uh, you know, we pick some every day for them because I just think I just love dandelions and I think it's good for them. And they seem to agree. They just go for it. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And I was saying, and that's a comment on you saying that the double yoker would be if the, the hen is eating too much. She's on the same uh, feed that my chickens are on and she's feeding the same way I am. So it's four ounces per day and 55% in the evening and 45% in the morning. You must have something tremendous out there for them that they're ranging on you know out there like i don't know if you're having a good grasshopper or cricket year or something because they're you know their intake of protein is well above the 21 grams that we're trying to get in 21 22 grams that we're trying to get in them that's pushing that egg size to be that big or the grains that the yeah ants there you go she says ants yeah yeah <laughs> That would do it. They're getting protein from somewhere. Um, yeah. 
You know, last year I had an ant hill at a spot where I didn't want it. And every single day I took a shovel full and took it to the, to the chicken run. And it was amazing to see them just go for those little mm. things crawling around, but they, they ate them, mm. just ate them all. Yeah. We had the locust this year, but, um, mm. you know, the 17 years ago when we had the locust, my chickens wouldn't eat the locusts. I, I, they were too big, I guess. I don't know. They were not interested in those locusts. I had broilers when they were here and they loved them. I'd even really? go into trees and get like the casings for them and I'd put them into a scoop and throw it in there and they went nuts for them. Yeah, I was able to catch like a couple of them in the last few days and my son went and just released it in the chicken coop. It was, a, first of all, there was a big squawk because they didn't know what it was. So all the chickens, feathers and everything flew all over the place. Then they figured out that it was food. Mm -hmm. And then there was a chicken run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, does the ground alfalfa powder actually stick to the feed or do you have to dampen it or something? And yeah, they had a lot of grasshoppers in Southern Alberta. I mm -hmm. saw actually a video where they were showing all the grasshoppers coming out of the, you know, they were combining. Mm -hmm. And they were showing the grain and it was like incredible. Like the amount of grasshoppers, they were just filling five gallon pails after five gallon pails wow. out of this out of this harvest. It was it was crazy. That's a lot. So how can you make the ground alfalfa powder actually, you know, stick to the feed a bit? I mean, you could wet it, you could add a little bit of oil to help it stick to the grains. You could do what um, maybe what um, Kenny Troiano does with your uh, with your with your supplement there. Just add uh, some oil and just mix it in together. That might work. Uh, Sheena, if you want to look, that video is actually shared on our Facebook page. He, he that's a good video. Yeah, he shows you know how he does it, and uh, the PNB or that supplement actually ha would have. A consistency, a texture that's quite, you know, maybe close to the, to to the PNB. So it should it should work, I would think. Yeah. Any other question from anyone? Boy, this is such a relaxing, relaxing <laughs> show. Okay, here we go. Jeannie's asking, do I add oil to the crab meal too? She she got some crab meal from us and I'm not sure uh, what kind of feed she's feeding. Are you feeding uh, pellets or is it a, me a mixed a mixed ration, Jean? I mean, anytime you have a lot of fines, adding either water or oil is going to help them stick together. Um, so yes, you can. I wouldn't add too much because if you add too much, it'll increase the energy in the fat and diet. Oh. Okay, so. that's probably the yeah. video. That's the yeah. video. From yeah, that's the like, that's Kenny's mixing up the. <clears throat> and um, yeah, it, what about uh, some people do too is to make things stick is add a little bit of water with molasses just so that there is a stickiness to it mm -hmm. which do you prefer oil or that mm, uh, i mean i don't really have a strong preface i know too much uh, molasses can cause some runny manure but i don't know i probably do oil i think you'd get the i think you'd get there a little faster with that yeah so jean says she feeds a mixed ration with some grain but the crab meal gets left or blows away a little bit of oil will help that. Yes. Yeah, yeah and Jean has showbird, so um, typically Can <clears throat> Canadian diets are low in fat anyway. They're not hitting that five or six okay. percent. So uh, using some type of vegetable oil, I don't really have a preference, but it's going to help with the sheen on the birds mm -hmm. and that feather dynamic. So. <clears throat> yeah. So any oil, any vegetable oil will do. Do you? Yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't have a strong preference. Whatever you know, whatever people can get at a reasonable price. Kenny likes olive oil. Mm -hmm. He thinks that there's other added benefits to the olive oil. Probably is. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but it's again, probably, it's personal preference. Probably depends too on the on the cost that you're you know ready to or willing or able to. 
I don't think olive oil is necessarily the cheapest one out there. <clears throat> Sunf maybe sun. Uh, what yes. about sunflower oil? Sunflower oil works great. Yeah, um, works fine. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Mm -hmm. ah, there we go. Nice. Canola oil from Costco is yep. the cheapest you can buy. Thank yep. you, Marnie. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Yeah, and canola oil works just fine. There's mm -hmm. no reason not to use it. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> just don't overdo it. It doesn't take a lot. Yeah. How um, much? How much would you think? Would you? Would you say? Well, you know, um, Kenny's using a cup in twelve pounds, which I think is plenty, but. It can go up to 3% by weight without any issues, two and a half to 3% by weight. Okay. But, yeah, I think in his video, he even says that he decreased that oil a little bit along right. with, it just does. I mean, this is a little different because it's the supplement and you don't need maybe quite as much volume wise or weight wise than you would add the crab meal or the, or the alpha, alpha, alpha right. meal. Uh, it's kind of a concentrate, concentrated, concentrated, um, concentrated thing but that's yeah, I mean, normally in a ton a u.s ton a short ton i would add around 50 pounds of oil so that's two and a half percent so that's mm -hmm. a good starting point see if two and a half start at two two and a half percent and see you know if it's holding it well enough uh, that you're happy with it so. mm -hmm. okay would it be okay to feed a handful of canola still in the pods for a treat I don't see any reason why not as long as it's not a huge amount if it's just a treat mm -hmm. then i think that works fine yeah. yeah maybe we could cover that you know you if you have uh, some kind of a ratio and you know so much of the ration and then so much of you know treats or whatever how much should they be getting say if they have uh you know vegetable scraps and then you you come <laughs> along with the uh you know with the uh, sunflower seeds uh, i know I, I can see you laugh because you've covered that you've beaten that that horse dead uh, right now. you know Not that's everybody. that's like putting a bowl of candy on the table and telling your children they can have one piece okay you know <laughs> so pretty soon it turns into two then it turns into five then it turns into ten and you know chicken lovers can't help themselves okay so you know, one cup full of scratch grain or something similar as a treat per 25 hens is plenty. Okay. okay. That's, that's, the, it's that small of an amount. Uh, I tell people to keep it under 10% dilution. So whatever extras they want to give their birds has to stay under 10% uh, by weight. And that's whether it's table scraps, garden scraps, treats, you name it, you know, 10, the 10% rule. So So that means that 90% is their ration and 10% mm -hmm. is whatever else you want to give them, whether it's uh, mealworms, uh, <laughs> you know, crickets or, yeah. you know, whatever, whatever else. <clears throat> the only treats my chickens get, I mean, when I do canning and all that, they get scraps, but uh, otherwise, you know, their treats is dandelion greens and I keep it at that. It's kind of like mm -hmm. a healthy treat maybe and you know by weight it doesn't weigh a lot so i don't know how much it really throws there you it know doesn't. It, when you're talking about greens like mm -hmm. spinaches and lettuces and dandelions and greens yeah i don't care how much they get i really don't they can't they're not going to throw off their diet but mm -hmm. you know when you start throwing out like corn and you start throwing out scratch grain and you start throwing mm -hmm. out mealworms yeah you're yeah. you're you're changing the ration significantly at that point. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I have another question here. I know moisture in feet can result in mold not visible to the naked eye and resulting mycotoxins. Would oil be a concern in this matter at all? Or do you have to mix the oil in immediately before feeding? <clears throat> um, so I wouldn't be... Hmm. I answer that question. I wouldn't be super concerned about oil causing um, 
like rancidity unless it's old or if it's been sitting out in the sun. So if you've got good storage conditions for your feed, I wouldn't be concerned with it adding oil to make it go bad. Obviously, if you, or I shouldn't say obviously, um, but if you add oil right before you feed them, it's going to be the freshest. Um, but I think you need to fit whatever works in terms of your feeding management. If you do it once a week, that's probably going to be fine. If it's easier for you to do it daily, that works too. But I think storage conditions is a big part of the freshness of your feed. So would there be uh, concerns for my mycotoxins if you add your oil or is it just a rancidity thing? Um, well, mycotoxins actually happen in the field. They don't happen to an already mixed feed. Um, so basically uh, a crop gets a, a fungus and then the fungus essentially goes away and the byproduct of that fungus is going to be a mycotoxin. So that's what's left over. Um, so they're going to occur when, if you have like, a, like, if it's really wet, if you're, it's a drought, if there's any kind of stress when they're, when they're combining or, or harvesting the, the grain as well, that can cause mycotoxins. But um, in terms of feed, you can't put mycotoxins in there. Right, Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> it's getting late here. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So, no. Um, yeah. The, the oil is not going to change the mycotoxin level in the feed. It's not going to increase, decrease, stimulate, or anything else. Um, I wouldn't have any problem with feed being mixed for up to a week with the oil. You know, it's not going to oxidize that quickly, but you could probably go a week without any concerns. So if you wanted to do a week's worth of feed, that's fine with the added oil and the alfalfa and whatever else you're going to put in there. But, mm -hmm. you know, Alyssa's point being is the mycotoxins are coming in out of the field. They don't happen necessarily in the bin or the grain storage, unless it's poor grain storage where it gets rained on. Mm -hmm. But pretty much that fungus that causes mycotoxins is coming in out of the field and it occurred during the plant's growth cycle. So the let's say if you have a feed that's mixed that gets say wet and you see like a white fuzzy mold that grows on it, that's not mycotoxins. <clears throat> that's, no. that's what you're saying. Yeah, at that point, it's actually yeast. So if it's actually a white, white, it's more yeah. than likely a yeast growing. Yeah. Um, and if it had Fertrell Nutribalancer in it, it has yeast in our Nutribalancer. So mm -hmm. you're going to see that white mold or that white yeast growth a whole lot quicker, um, actually, than you would on a feed that doesn't have it, any probiotics added to it. So, so uh, is that detrimental to the chickens? In the Would first you... 24 hours, no. Yeah. But yeah, as that bacteria, as that yeast kind of lives, dies, and starts over again, yeah, then it's going to be excreting something. Now, yeah. in our case, you're going to get a yogurty like smell out of it, and then you're going to start getting kind of an alcohol type smell out of it. You know, at about three days, mm -hmm. it's going to start smelling like you're, you're making whiskey in the basement kind of thing so okay so if your chickens don't walk quite straight that's what's causing it you, or what? <laughs> you laugh but i had a fella i had this old gentleman down in southern virginia and he called me and he goes hey my birds are kind of walking funny and they're staggering around and you know i was asking all my normal questions with the guy and he goes yeah i soaked my grains and he goes most of them I use in a day or two, but every now and then, you know, a bucket gets away from me and it might be a week or two old. And and I'm like, yeah, come on, Charlie, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it, it has happened. Yeah, that's that's right. It doesn't take long to, yeah. to, to get alcohol formation. Well, it wouldn't. I mean, that's not even unheard of in nature. There are some birds, they go pick out on some berries and then you see them. Mm -hmm. They can barely hold to the branch. They are obviously drunk. Yeah. So it mm -hmm. can definitely happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would think more in the fall after the after the plant's been frosted mm -hmm. and the berries still on the vine. Because there's actually some berries that birds can't eat until after they've been frozen. Uh, yeah. They're toxic to them through the growing season. But right. And once the plant dies and they're frosted hard, they get 
you know, a couple good killing frost. Uh -huh. uh, actually, wild grapes is one of those. That's that's a very truthful statement. So, you know, wild grapes out in the woods, out in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. After they've been frozen back and it's, you know, middle of winter, uh -huh. you know, there's certain birds that are still feeding on those. And yeah, they they act quite, quite stupid, at, you know, yeah. if they've been there too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Sheena, does that, uh, does that answer your question? Do you have a follow-up question? <clears throat> I don't know if my comments are delayed here. I think they might be. I haven't no, seen anything no, else come through. That. Okay. Yeah, I'm one. watching it on Facebook, and that's yeah. that. Uh, Sheena's was the last one. So, yep. hey, okay. drunk drunk sure. birds and drunk chickens is a good place to end the day. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I think we'll just call it right there. So. <laughs> okay, there you go. All yeah. right, thank you for coming, Jean. Thank you for your questions. Yeah. Thank and, you all uh, for your questions. Yeah. yeah. Thanks everybody for coming. Yeah. Well. This was no exception. I, I always learn something talking to Jeff and I learned a lot today. <laughs> Not about drunk birds. <laughs> that, was, that was funny. All right, so, uh, well, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, yep. thank you, Alisa. It's always a pleasure to, <laughs> to have you. And uh, I'll let you... <laughs> I'll Poor Ingrid's going to be giggling about drunk chickens all night. So, all right. All right. All right. Thank you, Jeff. I guess Thanks. I'm going to have a nice evening. Yeah. Yep. All right. Bye for now. Bye.